Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to wait just a few more minutes in case we have a couple join us later. Uh, while we're waiting, if you would, in the chat, please type in uh, what church you're with and what age group you work with. Um, that'll help us get started. Okay, very good. Again, my name is Jennifer Howington. Uh, I am the Childhood Ministry Specialist for Texas Baptist. Um, I began this new role um, in January 1st of this year. And basically my, my job here is to equip you and to serve you and to be a resource for you as you serve the children and families in your, in your church. And so I have my contact information there, my email address, please feel free to call me or, or email me anytime. If there's any question I can help you with, or if you just need training uh, for your, your parents or even your, your leaders, I'm here to serve you. So um, I, we're, we're basically going to talk about the basics of children's ministry and teaching children uh, within the church today. So Remember my, my first class experience, I, I go back to that. That was 30 plus years ago. And knowing how uncertain I was, I was given this kind of this charge to take care of this fifth grade class. And all I had was a bucket of candy in a well-decorated classroom. I didn't know what to do um, beyond that. And so I'm hoping to give you some tools um, to help you as a leader uh, and as a teacher, and also to uh, encourage you along the way. So in my session today, I just want to give you some tools. So to get started, um, we are waiting for Sarah. Is Sarah here today? She is going to show us a video. She is helping with breakout sessions as well. So I'm going to wait until she's I'm here. You here. Okay. Do you have the video one queued up ready to go? It's ready. Okay, so I want to introduce this video. What we did, Sarah and I worked together in the childhood ministry department, and um, we interviewed some teachers, some seasoned teachers um, at three churches, three different churches, and just asked them a variety of questions, and things that they wish they knew then that they know now. So everybody has to start somewhere at first. And so I thought we would learn not only from this session today, but also from these ministry leaders across Texas and what they're saying about uh, what it means to teach. And so the first question I asked was, what are some things you know now as a teacher that you wish you knew from the beginning? So let's see what they say. It would, it would help to know that attention spans are pretty short uh, for preschoolers and that you should usually over plan, uh, plan more than you think you might need because it's better to be over planned than under planned and have um, plenty of activities for the littles to do. And then you can always uh, change your plan if you need to, or if you don't have, don't use something uh, that particular week, then it's a-okay. But over planning is usually better. The, the, the important message of it's going to be okay, <laughs> that uh, no matter how well you've, you've planned your day, you're, you've got everything set up, whether it's the activity or the lesson plan, uh, if, if things go awry, that that's okay. And, and making sure um, that uh, the, the ability to remember that and know that uh, is a wonderful thing. I wish I'd give, been given that early on that it's, it's going to be okay no matter what happens. I wish I had known how important it is to make connection with the parents. Uh, with young children, uh, 
the parents bring them to the door and pick them up and you have a chance to get to know them and, and speak with them and, and get comfortable with them and, and they with you. Uh, but older children, fifth graders, uh, they usually come and go on their own and you may never even see the parents. Um, I learned how important a phone call um, or a home visit, uh, taking by some little treat for the, for the kid, for the kids and uh, how much that means to not only the children, but to the parents themselves. Uh, they have a chance to get to know you and in a different setting and spend some time with you and you've established a communication with them. Um, sometimes uh, they feel comfortable calling you, maybe asking you for some help with their child, the child's having trouble at school or home because you've made that connection. Uh, and for those parents who are not members of church or don't even attend, uh, sometimes that's a way of establishing some rapport so that they feel comfortable uh, to come to church and uh, maybe attending a, a worship service or an adult Sunday school class. Okay, so we have three, and I'm gonna get my, my screen back up here. Uh, three individuals that we interviewed and um, I think there's some wise words there. You know, Will said, it's going to be okay. It really is. You know, that, that first day in the classroom, uh, sometimes when you're in a classroom full of children, it feels like controlled chaos or maybe uncontrolled chaos. <laughs> I know that first, you know, class I, I, I taught, you know, I, I made the mistake of giving them candy early on, but, you know, you learn and sometimes things do go awry and that's okay. That doesn't mean that you're doing a poor job. It means you're learning your students. You're learning how to best meet their needs. Um, Catherine told us about attention spans. She wished that she knew that there were certain attention spans and to you know, zone in on that. If you work with preschoolers, um, you have about one minute per age. So um, for a one-year-old, you can probably get their attention for about a minute, a two-year-old, two minutes, and three and four and so forth. So obviously the older the child is, the more um, time that you have to, to talk with them. Um, also Linda from First Amarillo, she commented that the connection to the parents, I, I think that's critical. And I think that's very much something that we want to tackle early on. So the children that you serve in your classroom, you know, they're your group and you're ministering to them, but I think your ministry is even bigger than that. You know, I always told my, my leaders uh, when I served on church staff that your ministry is not only to the child, but also to mom and dad, our grandma and grandpa, our aunt and uncle. So it's really a family ministry concept. And I think Linda touched on that when she said, you know, about making phone calls, about, you know, writing notes to the children, about reaching out to the parents to say, how can I help? How can I serve you in that way? Those things never get outdated, you know, and it's very, it, it makes you more approachable as a teacher. Um, I had a, a student the other day, she has been in my ministry since she was four years old, um, she's in high school now, she's a freshman, and I was driving down the road headed to a church, I was going to lead training last Sunday, and I happened to pass them on the tollway. Uh, I thought it was them, but I wasn't sure, but then a call came through, and Ava was on the phone, and Ava said, Miss Jennifer, where are you going? And I said, is that your car in front of me? And she said, yes. And so we had just this little two minute conversation. But after we hung up, I thought, you know, my ministry expanded even beyond the reach of when she was a child in my ministry. She's in high school now, but she knows she can call me. She knows that I'm here for her and her family. OK, so let's talk. Let me segue here. Let's, let's talk about your role as the teacher. OK, so what is your role as the teacher? Let's throw out some ideas if you want to put those. Um, actually, I can't see chat right now. So if you want to just kind of, you know, shout that out or just kind of throw out some comments, what do you think your role is as a teacher when it comes to preschool and children? Teach God's word. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. That is our, 
our biggest role, right? We're teaching God's word, the most important book that's ever been written. Um, exactly. Good. Any others? Okay. Oh, I do see the chat now. Okay. Example of Christian living. That's great. That's great. We are an example. We're going to talk about that. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Any more comments? Good. Okay. So I would submit to you that you are more than just a conduit of information. Okay. My screen's not sharing anymore. Okay. Not sure what's going on here. There it is. You're more than just a conduit of information. You are teaching um, the most important message of all time. This is more important than any history class or any math class, any science class. This is the most important content. So you're sharing content, but the content is more than just information sharing. You are speaking into the life, the spiritual life of a child, and you are speaking into transformation of that child. So if we're just teaching a class and we're approaching it from the perspective of just teaching information, we've missed the whole point. We are teaching for um, transformation. And the way we communicate these truths, we're not just sharing information, but we're also participating in the discipleship process. So I have another chat came through. Okay, welcome, Brenda. Glad you're here today. Glad you're here. Working with those first graders. We're so glad you're here. So we're more than just a conduit of information. Someone also said that we teach by example, and you are exactly right. We teach through the example and relationships. Did you know that children learn best through relationships? When they think of how a child interacts with you when uh, they come into your classroom, you know, they'll come and hug you. They'll come, some may want to hold your hand at certain ages. They want to sit on your lap. That's them building relationships through you, okay? They not only learn through their relationships with you, but also through their relationships with their peers. So that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship is also very important within the classroom, okay? So my screen share is not working. I'm so sorry. I can't advance to my next slide. I'm going to stop this for a minute and go to a different slide. Here's a quote here I want to share with you. Yes, Steve, give hugs and show love. Exactly right. We need to be prepared for those things when children come into our classrooms. Um, and I would even say, don't be a distracted teacher. You know, we, you know, children come prepared to share their heart. And I always made sure that I had everything ready in my classroom before a child entered the room. That way, when they came in, they knew they were the most important thing to me in their life. Okay. They have stories to share. They want to tell you about their baby brother and what baby brother's doing, how they helped uh, give him a bath or how they helped mom clean the kitchen or how they threw a baseball with dad outside. So all these things are so important. And if we see those things as um, developing relationship, that's part of your teaching, not just teaching the content of the Bible, which is important as well, but also developing that relationship. Um, Howard Hendricks, this quote over here, um, he was a longtime professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he said, you teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. So when we look at that, in other words, if we're living out our faith in such a way that our example and our teaching and our relationship reflects Christ, that's what others will see in us. And so we also need to invest in ourselves. Um, um, we also need to invest in ourselves um, as teachers. So how do we do this? What are some ways you think you can invest in yourself as a teacher, whether you're teaching two-year-olds or fifth graders? Any ideas? Attend training such as these. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> You're already doing that today, right? 
Good. So investing in training and, and pouring into yourself as a leader. Any others? You know, one of the dads um, that I used to serve with, um, I used to serve with, he was one of my teachers, but I also had his son in my ministry. And one of the greatest compliments he ever gave me was, I see your teaching in my son, meaning the son was reflecting what he had learned from his children's minister. So that that is a high compliment and a high calling as well, that we need to be a reflection of what we are teaching. So I'm going to look at the chat a little bit here. I'm sorry to go back and forth, but you guys are giving me such good information. I don't want to miss anything. So asking for advice um, from seasoned leaders. I think that's very wise. You know, there's even even if you're a seasoned leader, we always need to be asking others, you know, advice on how to handle certain things and how to best reach our families. Um, Janice told us grow with my own Bible studies. Yes. I mean, really, the lesson that you prepare for Sunday should not be your only Bible study that you do all week. You need to be investing in yourself. You need to be having personal interaction, personal relationship with Christ so that he can pour into you so that you can pour into others. Uh, Brenda says, talk to mentors. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are others that you serve alongside who have been doing this for years. And so talking with them and, and learning from them, you may um, do things that they do just because it, it's been proven. It works and it's, and it's great. Bethany says to get help from others. Absolutely. Don't ever be afraid to ask for help from other people. That is wonderful. Um, we are merely a vessel. You know, we need to also allow the Holy Spirit to move in the child's life. You know, those questions that they ask. Um, my, I, I teach preteens at my church now. And one day we were talking about Cain and Abel. And we were giving information, but one of the little boys raised his hand. We were talking about how Cain killed Abel. And he says, do, um, do people who kill others go to heaven? You know, it seemed like a, a crazy question, but really he was trying to dive into the details. He was searching for information and needed to know, you know, how that information worked within the context of that lesson. So be responsive to those that you teach. Hendricks also said the effective teacher always teaches from the overflow of a full life. So there is no way we can teach what we don't already possess. And so we teach from the overflow. So if you have that personal relationship with Christ and you are, you know, in constant prayer with him and searching the Bible and seeking his truth, that can't help but overflow within your classroom. So we must be pouring into our own lives through prayer scripture reading, personal Bible study. So think of ways that you can also pour into yourself, uh, whether it's through quiet time or personal Bible study. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Teaching is an investment in the lives we serve. We must be both available and approachable. That's not kind of something that I alluded to earlier when I talked about my call that Ava gave me. If I had not been approachable or available, she would have never called me. She would have thought I was just a teacher from the past, but she knew I loved her and that I would want to know that they were driving in front of me on the tollway. And so it opened up the door for just a, a small little brief conversation and just interaction to let us know that we still cared for each other. So be both available and approachable. How do you do this? So if you listen to the stories that the children tell you, they will take the initiative. Children want to talk to you. And so I would just say it's so easy. Just listen and respond. Get down to their level, eyeball to eyeball. I Sometimes I, if, if the child's really small, I'll sit in a chair so that I'm eyeball to eyeball with them or get on my knees on the floor just so that they see that I am equal to them and talking with them and I'm wanting to, to listen to what they have to say. Let them know that what they say matters. I've heard it said that people will not care what you know until they know how much you care. Okay, I'll say that again. People will not care what you know until they know how much you care. Children are the same. When they know that you care, 
they are going to listen and absorb who you are. They may even want to be like you in some ways. And so that's part of being an example and building relationships. I would also say spend time getting to know the children that God has entrusted in your care. What are some ways that you can get to know children? I'm going to open this up to um, you to respond now, either through chat or um, by speaking, unmuting and speaking. So what are some ways that you can get to know children while they're in your classroom and even beyond? Visit their home. Good job, Janice. Yeah, absolutely. Asking them about their interests. They will tell you. They will talk to you. Exactly. So when you're you're investing in their lives and you're taking an interest in them, that builds trust. Play on the playground. Absolutely. I love that, Steve. I hadn't thought of that. But when you go on the playground, actually go play with them. You know, throw a ball with them or, you know, you know, whatever is conducive for the, the playground that you have. Climb a tree with them. I love that. <laughs> You're going to be a fun children's leader. I can already tell. That's great. Feed them. I don't know about feeding them grasshoppers, though. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Interacting with them, you know, being a part of their life, being that healthy adult in their life that they can trust and, and lean on. So great job. Great job. You know, I would say, you know, investing in their lives, celebrate with them the good things that happen when you know that it's their birthday or they 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 won a game if they're old enough to play baseball or soccer, you know, celebrate with them, get excited, high five them, you know, let them know that you celebrate who they are. See them as individuals, not just as a group of um, children that you meet with once a week. OK, the last one on this slide says, be a student of your students. So know your students, um, know what their individual needs are. Are they shy or afraid to volunteer answers? Do they like to be first in line? Are they competitive when you do an activity in class? Each child is different and each group from year to year will be different as well. So be a student of your students. That very first day when you have that first group, take time to get to know them, you know, know their, um, who they are and what they need. And, you know, like my, my, I'll refer back to my group of preteens that I teach. I have a group of mostly boys. I would say a lot of boys and maybe only two girls. And so the dynamics of that group is going to be much different than the group uh, that I've had in the past. And so, okay. I have dressed up like Bible characters. You know, I think that's a good idea. Did Steve say that? That's great because that is, you know, helping to show them the fun side of learning, you know, and if their teacher dresses up and, and gets on the floor and, and does silly things, then they're going to remember that. And that's going to make an impact on their learning. Valerie says, remember their prayer request, follow up with the concern. I could not agree more with you on that. I think that is actually key. And that could be an open door to, you know, ministering to the families if you know that there's a prayer concern, like grandma is sick and in the hospital, you can make that phone call <clears throat> and check in with the family and see, is there anything I can do for you? You know, that expands that reach from the classroom to the home. So Valerie, I think that is wonderful, following up on prayer requests, you know, and children will tell you, they will tell you what's going on in their lives. Um, Bethany says, remember games? test whatever big thing they had the week before. Exactly. They have things going on in their lives. And so when you remember, maybe when you take prayer requests, if you're able to do that in your classroom, <clears throat> keep track of it, follow it up on the next week, see how it goes. Say, you know, well, Johnny, how was your test? How was your math test? Did you do good? You know, and celebrate when he tells you he gets an A. And if he doesn't get an A, you know, and he's sad about it, then you can also dialogue about that. So just investing in the lives of these children. Okay. All right. So that is um, the role of the teacher. Now we're going to look at our um, teacher friends again. We have another video to show. This question <clears throat> says, what did you need the most help with when you first started teaching? So they were once in your shoes and just started teaching. So let's see what they say that they needed the most at that time.
importance of, of communication. And what I mean is I can talk. <laughs> I love to love to talk and can get excited about, uh, about wonderful uh, uh, examples of how much God loves us. But the actively listening and, and not just hearing what I want to hear from the from the, the child's question, but hearing the whole thing and, and being able to take uh, the, the children's ministers, Curtis and Wayne and, and now Julie, uh, being able to take the, the, the lessons that they've taught us and the importance of, of being able to remember that, uh, uh, that we can apply different ways to to communicate with the kiddos, and, and that's something I think uh, is, is so important. Having really um, committed and solid volunteers and other teachers uh, who are willing to be committed week by week uh, and consistent really is one of the most important things. If you can find a friend to come teach with you uh, and who will be consistent, that is probably the, the most important thing. When I first started teaching, I needed help in making the objective uh, the main point. I would get lost sometime in, in teaching other things, adding them to the lesson, things that I thought were really good, things were very interesting, uh, but they did not lend themselves to the main point, the main objective. So what I have started doing is making sure that when I uh, write out my lesson plan that I'm going to use on Sunday, I put in bold letters, I type in bold letters at the top, the objective, what the students need above all else for that lesson. If the other gets in, that's fine, that will add to it. But I need to make sure that I do uh, get the main objective into the lesson. I think that is very helpful information. You know, Will talked about communication. You know, if you are currently serving, let's say, in a third grade class, for instance, it might be helpful for you to talk to that second grade teacher and say, tell me what you know about these students. What do they need? Uh, what are their, you know, differences? How can I best meet the needs of all? Which one is shy? Which one has trouble, you know, getting to class on time? You know, anything like that, anything you can learn ahead of time would be helpful. So, and also Catherine talked about having someone to, to team teach with her. You know, maybe there's a friend, you know, that can teach with you and that has just a heart for this age group that you do. Um, I know our churches right now are struggling with uh, getting volunteers. And so having a helper can be a good thing. Maybe even a teenager that can step in and help every now and then. And then Linda tells us about having an objective, knowing what your main point is, what you want them to learn by the end of the day is also critical. OK, all right. So we're going to move to the next slide um, and talk about cognitive levels of development. OK, so it's one thing to know what you're going to teach, but you need to know who you're teaching. OK, you know what your job is, but you need to know who you're teaching. So, and it's different for each age level. So you cannot effectively teach um, a fourth grade class and teach them the same way you would a four-year-old class. There are differences. They learn differently. There's only so many things that they can cognitively um, understand. So we're going to kind of go through this picture, make sure everybody can see the full picture. Uh, if you need to move your screen share a little bit or do a different view. Um, <clears throat> but this was developed, the cognitive levels of development was um, developed by a Swiss philosopher named Jean Piaget, okay? He was a psychologist and philosopher, and he worked with child development. So I think that there's some things that we can learn by looking at just this one picture. And I would challenge you to kind of look at specifically the age level that you work with and kind of see where things fit in. But I'm going to go through the whole age group, Okay. So this is how children develop intelligently and intellectually. OK, so from birth through two years, they are in the sensory motor stage. OK, what does that mean? These are your babies and toddlers. They all experience the world through their senses. OK, if you've ever seen a baby or a toddler walking around putting things in their mouth, the mouthing stage, that's how they're discovering the world. It's not just that they're teething, which you would think, but 
it's that that's how they're discovering the world. You know, they can't look at it and decipher it. So it's through their mouth and their senses and their touches. <clears throat> and so this baby in the high chair, so he is sitting there holding a glass of water. Okay. Um, that's how he's experiencing the world by touch, by holding, by looking at it. Okay. At this stage, babies don't have a sense of what we call object permeance. I know I'm giving you big words, but all that means is when something's out of sight, it doesn't exist. <clears throat> so think about the implications of that. If a baby thinks that something that they can't see no longer exists, how do they look at parents who leave the nursery? Okay. Can you understand why they would panic a little bit and maybe cry? Because they don't know that mom and dad are still out there. They just can't see them. They haven't developed that sense yet, that object permeance. Okay. So that's why they have anxiety at this age when mom and dad leave the nursery. Okay. Now, if we look at age two to seven year olds, we are now in the pre operational stage. Okay. At this phase, language is being developed. Objects can be represented by words, but they have yet to think logically about it. Okay. So this little boy, he's pointing to the water, the glass of water, and he's saying water. So he knows that that object that he's pointing to represents the word water. So that's when the language development comes into play between two and seven years of age. Okay. <clears throat> they can string words together by this time, make sentences, but they're not able to think logically. So in other words, like say they can count to 10, but they can't subtract 10 from five or five from 10. They can't do that yet. So, but they can count to 10. Um, this is also the stage where they can pretend play. So you'll, you can see uh, a child maybe having a broom and pretending it's a horse and he's a cowboy. Pretend play is very big at this pre-operational stage. Okay. Also at this stage, they are what we call egocentric. Okay. <clears throat> this is their inability to differentiate themselves from others. They are unable to see the world from someone else's perspective, only their own. So it's a very all about me phase. Okay. Um, usually this subsides by age seven, but since it's all about me phase, this is what children will say. That's not fair. They're not sharing. They're concerned about me at this stage. So if you're working with preschool, maybe even up to your kindergarten and first graders, this is the stage that you will find yourself in. Also at the early stages in preschool, children prefer to play alongside their peers. Okay, so they're not necessarily, those little two-year-olds that are playing, they're playing beside each other, but not necessarily with each other. It's not until they get to be a little bit bigger that they can um, participate in interactive play, playing together, like in a home living center, you know, cooking together and making a meal and sitting down. That comes later in later preschool. Okay, so now we're going to go to the concrete operational stage. Um, ages about seven to 11 years old. This is now the point in time where children can think logically. Okay, I'm going to show you an example. I don't know if you can see my screen, but I have two glasses of water here. Can everybody see me okay? Okay, so two glasses of water. So a child at this stage um, has the ability to think concretely. Okay, so this is called conservatism. When something changes form, so I a child at this stage can tell me, okay, you have this much water in two glasses. If I pour water into this other glass, does this mean I have more water because this is more full or fuller or do I have equal? A child at this concrete operational stage can say you have equal because all you did was pour <clears throat> one water to the other. They can differentiate that. So they are thinking more logically, a child at the pre-operational stage would not be able to do that. So you can see kind of their level of learning and cognitive development is increasing as they get older. Okay, I have a question in chat. I'm going to pause for a minute. I want to make sure that I'm um, <clears throat> answering all your questions. Steve says, what is the impact of a child that has no older brother or sisters versus one that does? You know, that's a very good question. Of course, every child is different. 
But we have seen that a child that has older siblings can learn a little bit faster and maybe they're just mimicking what they've heard their older siblings say, uh, but they do tend to progress a little bit faster than a child who is the first child. So that's a good question, Steve, that you do have to be aware of those differences. But of course, every child's different. You could have a, a first child who develops through these stages at a faster pace as well and equally can make that logic understandable. So great question. Keep those questions going. I want to make sure we're, we're in dialogue here and that I'm helping you to, to better understand the children you serve. <clears throat> okay, we're going to look at the last stage, the formal operational stage, okay, of cognitive development. This happens around age 12, and this is where children, they're, they're about to move into the youth group, okay, so they're about to advance out of the children's ministry, and this happens through adulthood, so they can think more in abstract terms, so a child at the more concrete level of learning, you know, can only understand the facts, you know, they can understand that Jesus died on the cross, um, Jesus died to save us. Jesus is the savior. But at this formal operational stage, they can understand concepts such as what does grace mean? You know, what is the function of the Holy Spirit? You know, if you try to explain the Holy Spirit to a first grader, they might can regurgitate what you say, but they're not going to fully understand that that is an abstract concept. And so have that in mind as you as you say things and as you teach, because the older the child, the more abstract thinking they can have, but your younger children are gonna be more concrete, literal thinkers. <clears throat> so um, a child also in this formal operational stage, they can manipulate ideas in their head without having to manipulate things in their hands. So you see this child right here, he's contemplating the water, <clears throat> back to our water situation. Is it half empty, half full? He's thinking logically. He's thinking through things and how he sees the world. It's not just a matter of it's water and I'm saying it's water. He's thinking logically about it. They can understand concepts as grace, such as grace. Um, also, their moral development. By the time they're nine to 12 years of age, their moral development is completely complete. <clears throat> and so this means that they understand more uh, of less of what's good and bad. Usually at a smaller ages, it's, you know, what's good, what's bad. But at this older age, they're thinking about more of what's right and what's wrong and making decisions for themselves. So knowing these stages of development <clears throat> can be helpful when we teach. We can't teach a fifth grader the same way we teach a two-year-old. The age, age appropriate levels of learning can help guide us through here. So I'm gonna pause for a minute. We've got a question. <clears throat> Brenda says, what is the best way to get the room's attention when you are ready to start the, the lesson with 11-year-old class? Okay, so these 11-year-olds is about, let's see, fifth graders, possibly fifth or sixth graders. You know, that is my heart. I love that age group. And what I would always used to do um, to get their attention, I would start with an activity. Um, you don't want to automatically just start, <clears throat> you know, with a lesson you know, have them sit down and, and expect them to stay focused. Have an activity, get them moving, get them talking to each other. And it can be, you know, a lot of our curriculums have activities that they suggest. It could be one of those, or it could just be an icebreaker. You know, if it's your first time in that classroom and you need to get to know each other, start out getting them talking to each other and then kind of segue into the lesson. <clears throat> but if you try to start just with, open your Bible, let's read about Noah's Ark, you may not have their attention fully. So that's a, that's a great question right there. Uh, let's see, Steve asks, do we have a list of objectives, goals, milestones, fundamentals that we need to ensure the children learn upon completion of each age group or school year? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. In fact, that's a, the nice little segue to my next comment. <clears throat> if we can go to the next slide. Lifeway Resources has published what they call levels of biblical learning. We could actually spend all day talking about the specifics of this, but 
what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to give you the website. So if we'll press the space bar again, Sarah. Um, if you'll go to this website, there are basically 10 elements that a child needs to learn. And this actually, the levels of biblical learning goes from babies through high school <clears throat> and what they should learn at each stage. Now, you know that a child who comes to church for the first time as a fifth grader is going to have to start with fundamentals and you'll have to weave that into it. But overall, what a child is able to learn at a certain age is tackled in this levels of biblical learning. So they break down things such as salvation, um, Jesus, creation, <clears throat> God, things like that. So there's basically 10 levels. And so I would advise you to visit this website, take a look at it, and also just review kind of what each child is able to learn at each level. So for instance, I'll give you an example. For a preschooler, how you present the gospel message starts as Jesus is my friend. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves my family. As you progress, though, your first, second, third grader can understand <clears throat> Jesus died on the cross. <clears throat> Jesus died for my sins. And then Jesus died to save the world. OK, so a preschooler, you would not want to present the um, the elements of the cross. That would be terrifying for a preschooler to have that kind of content. But as you your child ages, they can understand more of what that means and how that impacts the gospel message. So did I answer all your questions? Is that, is that helpful? Okay, please feel free to keep, you know, dialoguing in chat. I will attack as many as I can. We have another video <clears throat> we'd like to show. This question is, what are some teaching skills that you see in others that you would like to imitate? Let's see what they say. Um, a teaching skill that I observed a teacher using very effectively one time was using uh, learning styles. Uh, I knew about them and but had not used them uh, consciously in my Sunday school class. And uh, I, I thought that was something I needed to try to do. So I began to make a real concerted effort to uh, have the children use all their, all their sensory uh, motions, all their uh, walking and talking and using their hands and using their feet, uh, even bringing a few little uh, snacks that fit in with the lesson, uh, maybe such as foods that Jesus might have eaten when he was a boy. Uh, some things like that that would get them into their, those that needed a little extra sensory uh, help would get them into their, into the lesson. Uh, and I have tried to do that since. I don't always do it as well as I should, but that really made an impression on me when I saw that teacher and I thought, yes, she's doing it. I need to be doing more of that. The the thing that I enjoyed uh, so much in the early years is my wife helped me in, in teaching uh, third graders and uh, she had wonderful patience and I've improved my patience and my ability to, to be patient and uh, there's a sweet woman, Miss Jan, that teaches first graders here for forever and she has uh, such a wonderful uh, uh, example of, of patience and that's something that I know that I've, I've got to continue to improve, but I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, I think that I've, I have seen other friends who teach really incorporate role playing and acting out their story. Uh, and, and that really brings it more to life for the children. I think I haven't done that as much with my three-year-olds, but have been incorporating it more as I have been able to watch other teachers teach. And that really gets the children excited about the story. And then it helps just to really cement, cement it in their minds. Okay, I think we can learn a lot from our, our, our teachers here in our videos. Um, 
Linda touched on something. We're going to transition kind of to a new topic here about learning styles. And that's what Linda mentioned, um, learning styles in your teaching. Um, children are different. The way one child learns may be different from what another child learns. And so um, <clears throat> Sarah's going to pull up my screen for me in just a few minutes. But um, we need to be aware of the different learning styles. There's several of them, um, eight, I believe, maybe 10. And I'm going to discuss each one just briefly. But I want you to think through ways in your classroom that you might could incorporate this. Now, our curriculum, I will say, <clears throat> most curriculums that you use will try to involve most of these learning styles, but some of them are not represented that may be a better fit for your children. So you need to think through that. Um, let's first look at Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss says, today you were you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive that is youer than you. Okay, so if I teach only one learning style, <clears throat> you may reach the needs of one child or two, maybe. But if you teach to all learning styles, <clears throat> you have a better chance for them to understand better and learn in the way that they're designed to learn. So let's talk about those learning styles. Okay. The first one is verbal. Okay. Your verbal learner <clears throat> thrives on words, whether it's spoken or heard words. They will benefit when you read scripture passages, <clears throat> when you recite scripts, or when you just talk. So your verbal learner, okay? The second one is your visual learner. Your visual learner needs to see things. Um, these learners are typically strong in subjects like English or history. So in conversation, your visual learner will often reference what they have read, <clears throat> okay? So charts, and graphs are helpful to a visual learner. So be practically, we don't have charts and graphs, you know, in Bible studies. So maybe that teaching picture, <clears throat> you know, showing that teaching picture of David and Goliath, pointing to which one's David, which one's Goliath, and having them visualize what they see. Your visual learner is going to benefit from that. Also in showing videos, you know, some of our curriculums have um, missions videos or interactive videos. That appeals to your visual learner. So have that in mind when you, when you teach that there needs to be a visual element um, for your visual learner. Okay, the next one <clears throat> is your physical learner. I would say this is also called kinesthetic learning. Most people, in fact, about 87% of us learn on some level the physical learning. Okay, they need to touch things. They need to manipulate things to learn. Um, this is also your tactile learner, <clears throat> which appeals to the sense of touch. They like to work with their hands and, and have concrete activities that they can do. So they will need to practice a new skill instead of just reading about it. So if you were to say, okay, I'm going to show you this object lesson, but you can't touch it, you can't manipulate it, you can't, then their learning style isn't being fully met. Children need an opportunity to actively engage in the physical learning um, process. So having an activity where they can do that can be helpful. So like maybe dressing, someone mentioned dressing up as uh, characters in the Bible and, you know, acting that out. That appeals to the visual learner who has seen it act out, the physical learner who's actually a part of the story and getting to tangibly do something and also your verbal learner. So you're really with one activity in acting out a script, you're appealing to your verbal, visual, and physical. So that's, that's a win-win for all of them. Okay, your next one is your musical learner. Yeah, musical learner. Musical learner learns through sounds and rhythms. They love to sing or play a musical instrument like singing the books of the Bible is an example of learning by singing. So I would have to say this one's probably the hardest one to do. <clears throat> maybe you could have music in the background as children enter the room, or maybe you can have a song time where you just sing certain songs that appeals to your musical learner. Okay. The next one is logical. 
A logical learner learns through systems and sequences. They like to figure things out logically. So they like puzzles. They like to <clears throat> coordinate things and try to piece things together. These kind of children are usually strong in math and science. So you can have children solve puzzles, put things together, um, anything that requires logic or reasoning. And I found that logical uh, really works well in group settings. If you put children together and have them fit together something, uh, work a puzzle together or solve a, <clears throat> a crossword puzzle or something like that, that appeals to your logical learning, but it also helps enhance the learning style because they're working with somebody. <clears throat> okay, the next one. It's relational. Your relational learner learns best when he or she is around others. They love to work in groups. An example of this would be an activity game where the children participate together. They are also learning relationally through you, their relationship. Remember I said earlier that children learn through relationships. And so having a healthy relationship with you as their teacher can appeal to the relational learner as well. Okay, the next one. Okay, your reflective learner, this is the child that prefers to work alone in solidarity. They enjoy writing down their thoughts, thinking about their feelings, <clears throat> this is kind of, you know, a little bit uncommon, but it still is a learning style and we need to be sensitive for that child that prefers to work alone. That is a type of learning style. And so we need to meet their needs as well. And the last one. <coughs> the last one is your natural learner. So they learn best by being in nature. Um, children need to be outdoor. They need to outdoor play uh, or take time to go outside and do nature walks. I would say this is probably the most neglected learning style within our Sunday school classes, just because sometimes it's not practical for us to go outside. You have a classroom of 10 children <clears throat> going outside, you know, might not be easy to do on a Sunday morning. Um, but sometimes this is a learning style. Children can learn and soak in information just by walking outside, looking at God's creation, sitting in a tree, listening to a lesson. Those are all natural learning styles. In fact, we did a, <clears throat> we have a, a leader here in children's ministry circles who has talked and done research about outdoor play. And she suggests that children need to be outdoors four to six hours a day for optimal learning. That's just being outside, breathing, soaking in the sun, and that's something that we fail to do sometimes in, in our educational system and even in our churches. So that natural learner. So <clears throat> I'm going to invite you in the chat to tell me which learning style you think you are, which one is your strength and which one you think is your weakness. Let's take a moment. Just type those in. Just type which one is a strength and which one is a weakness and see where you fall into that category. <clears throat> and you may have more than one, <clears throat> like for instance, you may think you're a visual and physical learner at the same time. That's okay. Bethany says her strength is logical, weakness, musical. I think my weakness is musical too. <clears throat> I'm not a musician, so I don't think about incorporating music in my lessons. Steve says strength is visual, hands-on, natural, weakness is logical. <clears throat> Yolanda, uh, verbal is strength and musical is weakness. A um, lot of weakness in musical, I would agree with that. That is a tough one. Valerie says weakness is musical, strength is logical. Anyone else want to share? So you might think through, 
if you have a strength in one area <clears throat> and not another, you might lean more towards teaching that way. So if you're a physical learner, you, you might lean more towards teaching children that way, but you also need to pay attention to what the strengths of the children are. Um, Brenda says strength is visual, physical, musical, weakness is verbal in a way. Um, but all we need is just enough for our particular age group. Yeah, correct. <clears throat> just having that mindset. You know, so if you, in my example of my preteen group, I have a group of boys. They are physical learners. They want to be active. They want to move around. <clears throat> and so when I'm looking at the curriculum, I need to pull out those resources that appeal to that physical learning style. You know, I can't just appeal to visual or verbal <clears throat> all the time, although that is important too. But, you know, know, like I said earlier, be a student of your students, know what their needs are. And if you have a group or class that needs more visual, more physical, then, then work towards that effort to incorporate that more. Okay, great job, guys. One thing that I failed to mention earlier is at the end of the session, we're going to try to close out around 11 o'clock, if not sooner. We will have a drawing at the end um, for $25 Amazon gift cards. So hang with us until the end. Two of you will be the proud owners of a gift card. What we'll do is I'll have Sarah draw your names and we will email you the gift card um, <clears throat> within a few days. So we appreciate you joining us today and we wanted to just kind of celebrate what we have here and offer you a fun gift in return. Okay, any questions on learning styles? Does all of this make sense? Or you see kind of the differences between all of them? <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I wanted to make mention to you, there is so much within children's ministry to consider when we're teaching children, uh, maybe even more so than when we're teaching older youth or adults, because, uh, and this, this also, this learning pyramid applies to any age level, but we not only have to consider their developmental stages of learning, but also their learning styles. And now this learning pyramid is another thing. So I wanna make you aware of how we learn best, okay? So if you sit down and you listen to a lecture and you're not engaged and you're not interacting, you're just listening and hearing information, you're going to retain 5% of what you hear, okay? So I would be doing an injustice to you today if I only just spoke for two hours. OK, you would only walk away within a day of five percent of what you heard me say. So if I want to kind of ramp that up, and this is true with children as well. Reading, if you incorporate reading. So I have tried to incorporate that within the videos that you see. You, you have words on there uh, of the questions that we asked our speakers and, and things like that. So reading kind of amplifies that a little more. You're probably going to retain about 10 percent of anything you read. Audio visual, same thing, those videos. You saw faces of seasoned people who have served in ministry. You're probably gonna remember something of what they said, maybe something you connected with. Your average retention right there is 20%. That's still pretty low when you think about it. So if all I did was lecture or read or do audio visual, you're only gonna walk away with 20% of what I said. So demonstration. Remember, I did the demonstration with the, the water when we talked about children and their uh, conservatism and how they could say that this water is the same regardless if I have it in one cup or two cups. That was a demonstration. So you are more likely to remember that 30% of the time because I actually showed you something. I had an object lesson. So these object lessons that you do within your class, be mindful of that. That can be helpful. <clears throat> to a child, they can visualize it and see it and, and, and make that connection a lot better. So discussion groups, you know, when you have children um, talking to each other, it is okay to pause and take a moment and say, everybody find a partner. 
Let's talk about the story of Cain and Abel. Summarize in your own words what you heard the lesson to be. So that can be one way that you can have discussion group there. And the retention rate goes up 50% with that. So you see all these levels of, of learning ability and how it increases the more involved the student is in the process. <clears throat> Practice by doing increases retention to 75%. So if you, this is where like um, you have the children act out the story. You know, you tell the story of David and Goliath. They read it in scripture. Maybe they see a video, you know, and then they practice by doing it. Maybe one is David, one is Goliath, and they act out the story. They're going to remember 75% of that teaching. And then if they teach others, they'll retain 90%. Okay, so kind of have that in the back of your, your mind um, as you're teaching. Don't just fall into the 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 habit of just lecturing okay don't just read the bible tell them the story and then say are there any questions they're going to only remember five percent of that have them tell others the story have them demonstrate have them discuss it in a group have them act it out those things enhance learning so i'm going to take a look at our chat i see some stuff coming through <clears throat> steve says percentages are lower for younger repeat key things from previous week that is absolutely right Children learn by repetition, and it's going to sound um, repetitive to you, and you'll probably get bored with it, but they love repetition. So, you know, coming back and repeating what you are uh, recapping what you talked about last week and incorporating that into your new story will only enhance their learning as well. So that's a great point, Steve. I'm glad you said that. Okay, are there any questions about our, our learning pyramid here? <clears throat> All right, so I have done lecture today. We've read things. You've seen audio visual um, demonstration. You've kind of participated in chat today. We haven't really had an opportunity to discuss as a group. So there are ways that I could involve you more in this process. So uh, just learn that as you, you interact with the children in your classroom. Okay, Valerie says parents asking kids what they learn. <clears throat> gives kids a chance to repeat and teach. Absolutely. That's a great point. <clears throat> so encouraging your kids to go home and teach their parents what they learn. That's part of teaching others, that 90% retention. That's a great point there. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's see. We have um, another video. Um, this time I've asked our panel of experienced teachers <clears throat> to share a story, a short story of a time when you feel that you're teaching connected with someone in your class. Okay, so we're analyzing retention, how they connected and how they interact. And let's see what their success stories are there. and dads, grandmas and grandpas find me later sometimes and say, oh, he uh, sang the song over and over that you sang in Sunday school or she acted out that story again for me, was able to tell the story to me because of something that he had done that day. So it's, I guess it's more parents uh, who are telling me the stories that have been so um, meaningful. It's, it's personal uh, because in those early years, my wife and I uh, had the pleasure of teaching our, our, our children who are now in their early 20s, but we were going over the fruits of the Spirit and, and uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and ex an example of patience, I put a, 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 a drawing of a bomb with a fuse going all, all over the, 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 the board. And then I had a little a spark at the end, and I was describing how, as you grow and as you as you mature in your faith and the ability to to to, to exemplify this this level of, of patience before you explode, before anger kicks in, frustration kicks in, and I and I said to the kids, I said, "Look, this is me and my son 
walked up to the board and he, he erased this beautiful fuse and it gave me about that much. And I said, Jonathan, what are you doing? He goes, Dad, Dad, this is your fuse. I went, what, Jonathan? This thing can't be true. And he goes, okay, okay, maybe it's this much. Uh, but I think about, uh, I think about that. And that's one of my favorite stories. Uh, some years ago, um, we had a student who uh, did not connect well with the other students in the class. <clears throat> he uh, would disrupt and he would make sounds and noises and make comments that other children did not appreciate. Um, and one Sunday, I talked a little bit about archaeology. It fit in with the lesson, and I talked a little bit about it, even had some pictures there, some archaeologists in, in uh, the, uh, digging up some Bible uh, relics there, and he was very interested and added much to the conversation that I certainly didn't know about archaeology and what we were talking about. And so I tried that again in a couple of weeks, and it, it worked, and the other students began to notice him and begin to appreciate what he was saying instead of rolling their eyes and, oh, here he goes again. They were listening and asking him questions, and of course, that was definitely uh, the good attention that he needed to be getting. And so that was one of the things that I remembered uh, connecting with him, still see him to this day here in the church, and uh, we're, we're friends, and we, he will, he's a big grown-up guy now, but uh, we certainly do enjoy uh, getting to visit with each other. Okay, I love those suggestions. <clears throat> we want connection with our kids, right? And you're going to see those, that evidence of that connection at different moments in time. And I love the different stories. And if you notice, these students connected when they were actively engaged in the process of learning. These students didn't connect just by sitting and listening, lecture only, okay? They connected when there was something that they could connect to. Uh, Catherine's story of the songs, going home and singing the songs to their parents, that was a connection. And parents were able to hear what the children were learning through the songs. Um, I like Will's, um, the bomb, the fuse, and how the student would erase part of it and how they made that connection with each other in a funny way. You know, obviously, Will is probably a very approachable teacher and he felt comfortable, you know, doing that in his classroom. But I really like Linda's story of this disruptive child who wasn't paying attention. And then there was something that connected the archaeology that he had an interest in. And did you notice how she turned that for him to teach the others? Okay. So now he went from that disruptive child to teaching others to being a helper in the teaching. And, and that enhanced his learning process. Remember, if we teach others, we retain about 90% of what we teach. So maybe, maybe if there is a child that's especially interested in something that you're showing or that you're doing, let them be, become part of the teaching process. Let them hold and, and, and make the connection here. Let them hold the glasses, you know, and help you do that. Or, or let them, you know, point to the pictures and show the class, you know, whatever it is, help them to become part of the process. And that's I, I love those stories of how connection happened that way. Those moments will happen. You just have to be watching for them. Okay, we're going to go to our next slide. Um, now that we know all about you as a teacher, we know about the intellectual development of a child, child various learning styles, and the learning pyramid. Let's talk about how we can use our classrooms <clears throat> to disciple families and to expand our reach into the home. This is probably one of your biggest ministries right now. You know, it's easy to teach the children, but it's harder to get inside their home, <clears throat> you know. So let's consider how the young Hebrew children learned. Okay, consider Deuteronomy 6. It's a model of discipleship, and it starts in the home. When a, in Jewish tradition, children began from an early age to learn about faith manners in the home, not in the church. Parents would teach them in the home. That was God's original des design for discipleship. So they would be committed to learning the Hebrew Shema. And what that is, basically, Deuteronomy 6 is 
um, a portion of the Shema, but they would memorize it. Okay. And let's read it together. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. A Hebrew child would work day in and day out to memorize that scripture passage. They would close their eyes and memorize it. They would say it without looking because it was to become part of who they were as um, a Hebrew child. And notice the important elements there. It said the Lord is one. You know, we may think, well, that's obvious. You know, we believe in one God. But the Hebrew children and the Hebrew nation was surrounded by pagan nations who believed otherwise. And so what they were instilling was the truth <clears throat> from their culture and, and their faith base, not the cultures around them. And so we need to do the same. You know, how do we do that? How do we expand our reach beyond the classroom into the home? You know, we... Uh, we talk about ways we can interact with parents. And I would tell you, you know, when you have a parent come drop off the child and the older the child gets, you may not even see the parent. The child may just come to your class. But for those of you who have parents that come into your classroom, you may have one or two minutes with them to make an impact. <clears throat> I would say, use that to the best of your ability, okay? Ask that parent, you know, how are things in your home? If you know that there are, you know, a family member's in the hospital. Ask them about that family member. Ask if there's anything you can do. You know, I would even use it as a point of contact to say, you know, when that child comes to that parent, say, you know, Susan, what did, what did you learn today? Can you tell mom what you learned today in class? And if they're shy about it and they don't want to do it there, say, make sure you tell them when you get home and kind of point to the main point of the lesson. That's making a connection and that's connecting families and giving them an open door to dialogue about the lesson with each other. Okay, <clears throat> so the original design was for discipleship to happen within the home. What are some ways that we can facilitate that ourselves? What do you think you can do to make sure that the child is talking to mom and dad about what they learned? <clears throat> you can say that in the chat if you have some ideas. <clears throat> You know, you may have parents who don't come to church. You know, some a lot of my Wednesday night groups, uh, the children were just dropped off at church and parents didn't attend. Um, that may be a situation at certain times of the week. Um, maybe your Sunday morning, you know, you would have some interaction, but you may not ever see the parents. And so what are some ways we could reach out to the parents? <clears throat> okay, I'm getting some ideas here. It's great. Let's see. Talk to the parents when they pick up the child. Absolutely. That is your first window of opportunity. So make sure, you know, you have the children settled before parents come in and, and to seize that opportunity to talk to the, the parents. Uh, Steve says, send text or emails to parents with links to lessons related to videos they can watch at home. That's exactly right. You know, you can, you can dialogue with parents and give them information so that, you know, learning can happen at home. And you have no control over where that happens, but you can give them the tools. Um, I heard of a church recently that did, um, this was mainly for their, their guests, their first time guests. Uh, but as a staff, what they did, they got the guest information. You normally get a cell phone number with that, but they made a video and said, hey, Howington family, we are so glad that you were here on Sunday. We hope that um, you come join us next week and uh, we're here to answer any questions. You know, I'm Jennifer, I'm Jennifer, I'm on staff here, you know, whatever. But they made it personal and sent that video announcement to their cell phone. <clears throat> and they said their retention rate as far as people coming back to church was 80 percent because they had that touch, that relationship. They felt that they mattered. And so maybe we can do the same within our children's ministries. You know, how can we let families know that their presence there matters? 
and that we're here to serve not only their children, but them as well. Okay. Do you have any other, other ideas? Pictures. Oh, I like that. I'm glad you said that, Steve. That's great. One way that I always try to connect with, especially like my nursery um, parents, uh, was pictures. You know, so instead of the old school pager system where we give them a pager when they check in their child, I would get their cell phone number. <clears throat> and I would say, if you can give me the cell phone that you have on you today, and if I have permission to text you if I need to, um, would that be okay? And so you have their cell phone. And so that crying child that they leave, you know, parents, it's, it's hard for them to leave their baby crying. I would take a picture of that child only for them and <clears throat> of them sleeping or eating or content or playing and say, you know, your child is doing great. They're, they're comfortable. They're settled here in the nursery. You don't have anything to worry about. And that really was a connecting point for me because it told the parents, I care about how you feel. And my goal is to make sure your child is as comfortable as possible while they're here in the nursery and that their needs are being met. And so you would be amazing. It would, you'd be amazed at how much rapport was established just by sending a simple picture, you know, instead of, oh, your baby's crying. Can you come pick them up? You know, it's more of a positive note. You know, she only cried for a few minutes and, and now she's content and sleeping. You know, um, that that does wonder. So pictures, pictures when you're at camp, you know, just just for parents, you know, um, I was assigned to the zip line station. So any student of mine that zip line, I got a picture of them and sent it to their parents. And that communicated volumes to them. I was not only, you know, helping them to connect with the camp experience, but also to let parents know your child is having a blast and they're having a great time and I have their best interest at heart. So Steve, great job on the pictures. I think that is a valuable tool. You do have to be careful. You don't want to send pictures of other children. You know, you do have to protect privacy, but pictures of their child alone can do wonders in communicating that you care about their children. Any other suggestions here? I know some of our curriculum resources, they provide take-home pages for parents. If yours does, I would highly recommend that you know, that the child take it home and, and work something out with their parent afterwards. And there's no guarantee that they're going to do it. You might attach an incentive to it and say, if you bring it back next week with it completed, I can give you a piece of candy or something. It, it's just totally up to you. But that's something that would reinforce that would give the child an opportunity to teach their parents at home and parents will know what the children are learning. Um, invest in your parents, get to know them, be a resource for encouragement. You know, I know Facebook can be a bothersome sometime, but I used it just so that I knew what was going on in families' lives. You know, I just kind of scroll through, and if, you know, Cole was having a baseball game, I knew that I wanted to talk to the parents about that and say, hey, how did the game go? I saw where he won the game, and, you know, tell me about it, and it's just a connector point. You don't have to think of things. You can kind of use what you've seen on Facebook. Um, I would also say offer events where families are together, not separated. You know, family fun nights, um, game nights, fall festivals. Uh, yeah, Bethany's reading my mind here. <laughs> Give parents ideas for family nights like movies. Movie nights are fun. You know, you can have a movie inside your facility and have a concession stand where they come eat nachos and hot dogs and just have time together as a family. Uh, give them a reason to be together. So often our regular programming <clears throat> involves them being separated. You know, Sunday school separates all the ages. You know, if you have a Wednesday night program, we're separated. So let's think of ideas where we can have events where we're together. Maybe, you know, with your class, maybe you're just in charge of your class. Maybe have a family night with your class you know, invite them to come to your home, you know, or ask the church if there's a room that you can reserve where you can have hot dogs and, you know, show a movie or <clears throat> game night. You can just bring games to play. Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but think of ideas where you can bring the families together. All right. Maybe even also provide resources for devotionals at home. Okay. Advent's coming up soon. 
uh, this would be a great opportunity for families to do something together before Christmas. Okay. So before we do our drawing, we're getting close to the end. I think I'm gonna be able to let you out a little early today. I have one last video, okay? The question here is, what has been your greatest joy in teaching? Let's see what they say. The, the kiddos just come in so excited about being there and are so open to just learning about Jesus. They maybe have been in Sunday school Bible story little classes for all of their little lives growing up, or it may be that this is their first time, but it is so sweet just to see the light in their eyes when they're singing about Jesus or they're hearing the stories that might be familiar to them a little bit or maybe not even. They love it and that excites me too, just to see the excitement in them. I tell fifth graders that they are so much fun to teach because they can, they have, they're at a learning peak and I tell them that, uh, that developmental scientists will say this is uh, 10, 11 year olds. Uh, a lot of things are clicking for them at this age before they turn into adolescents. And so I, um, I enjoy that. I enjoy their uh, conversation with each other and I enjoy just, uh, just getting a you know, getting to know them as individuals, and, and they're able to do that at this age. They're not just looking at you only as a teacher, but as a real person. Of course, I'd have to say the greatest joy, uh, and this is one of the privileges, I think, of teaching children this age, is that they're understanding that they need salvation. Uh, they understand that they're sinners, and that they can't save themselves, and they know fully, uh, as, as much as any of us can, what it meant when Jesus died on that cross for them and when they make their profession of faith and are baptized. Uh, that's uh, a, a great joy to me uh, and thinking of all the teachers that have had input in that, but we get to see the outcome there in, in fifth grade many times. It's, it's complicated to say it this way, but we just got through camp and the wonderful uh, way First Baptist Louisville uh, takes our, our, our kids to camp is it's not just the children's camp, it's the youth group. And we're all in the same uh, facility. Whether we went out to Sabine Creek or uh, Chaparral or, or Timberline, but our camp Lake Levon. But the, the older kids uh, coming back and giving me a hard time, whether they're a junior in high school or uh, maybe they're in eighth grade and they're saying, hey, did you bring the candy bucket? Because we, <laughs> my wife had this great idea of this big bucket of candy. And when the kids bring their Bible into class, walk over and get a piece of candy. And, and having, having those, those, those young adults uh, approach and say, hey, I really love all that. Uh, ability to know that, that we were able to touch so many lives. Sorry about getting emotional. It's a great question. I love that. What a great way to end with the last video. Um, there is no greater joy, you know, and I look back that very first class that I taught, if I had given up when all the hyperness set in with all the candy, I think I would have missed out on so much. And so know that you are supported. Uh, we are here as a resource. Um, God will equip you. And there, all you have to do is come with an open heart, ready to, to love on these children the best way you know how and to pour into their lives. Uh, just be someone that they can love and they can trust. And um, the joys that come with it of, Having children connect with a story, having children ultimately accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that is ultimately why we do what we do, and also to disciple children in the faith and be that teacher that they can love for a lifetime. That is your calling, and I'm so glad that you have responded to that calling, um, and we want to pray for you 
um, as you begin that journey, whether you're starting from day one or that you've done it for a few weeks or a few years, no matter, um, we want to encourage you in that. So um, I have a few chat here. I want to make sure that I um, address before we do our drawing and before I pray for you. Um, Miranda suggested uh, inviting parents to join kids for Sunday school. You know, I haven't thought about that. That is a great idea, having a parent Sunday. You know, that is a win-win. You know, the kids will love having parents there and the parents will learn what the kids are learning and you get to pour into them. Um, Brenda says, when my first grader wrote me a thank you note with pictures of the lesson of creation saying how much she loved me and that I was her favorite teacher, that is a joy. That's what you have to look forward to. Um, um, Steve is asking for contact information, email or phone. I'm going to type that in the message really quick before we all dismiss. Um, Nelson, you're, you're, you're welcome for the class. Um, thank you for joining us. Brenda says that what was best was how she talked about the story of how much God loved her and her family. That is wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Sarah. She's going to be getting your names really quick, and we're going to announce two winners of $25 Amazon gift cards. You can use this on yourself, <laughs> or you can use it for your classroom, no matter what you use it for. We want to thank you for being here today and are so grateful for you. I'm going to real quick, while she's doing that, I'm going to type out my contact information um, we'll announce the winners and then I'll close this in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Okay. So here's my um, email address. All right. We've got our first winner. Our first winner is Nelson Sumner. So congrats, right, Nelson. Nelson. And our second is Christy Threadgill. All right. Congratulations to the both of you. Thank you for attending today. Um, as I said, please reach out to me if you have um, questions here. I am enclosing my email address on the chat. Um, does anybody have any questions that we can address before we close? Okay. Also, I'll let you know that this session has been recorded. So it will be available on our website at txb.org. Um, give us a few days to do that, but if you want to share this with another teacher or if you just want to watch it again or if you want to look at a certain slide, um, we are happy to allow you access to that. If you like um, my presentation slides, I'm happy to share that with you as well. Just send me a quick email, uh, whatever I can do to help. So, so grateful for all of you. Let me close this in a word of prayer. I just want you to know how much you are appreciated and how grateful we are that um, you are leading and leading children and leading well. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of serving you. Lord, there's no greater calling than to serve um, in ministry. Lord, I thank you also for just the privilege of serving preschool and children. Lord, the task may seem great, but we know that you provide and that you um, equip us and that you give us resources and that you give us the strength to learn and to be a student of our students. Lord, help us to be aware of how the impact we can have and the transformation that can occur. Lord, I just pray for each and every church represented today. I pray for the children in these ministries and their families. Lord, may they all grow in their walk closer to you. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Those of you who receive your Amazon gift cards, you will receive this in your email. So um, um, absolutely. Yolanda, I just got your information. I will definitely send my slides to you. And anybody else who would like that, just let me know. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. And I will um, see you later. Have a good day.